I want to do is create positive images of us. And by seeing more positive images around us, I believe that is going to cause self-esteem to rise. And I believe when self-esteem rise, you're going to assume greatness. Because that's basically how greatness happens. You got to assume it. Either you're going to be taught that, somebody's going to make you feel that way, but you're going to assume greatness. When people say you shouldn't, that's kind of being vain. And see, that's a lot of that uh, Christian stuff they teach you so you can stay humble. Humble is good. You know, because everything in moderation, you don't want to be arrogant. You don't want to be a know-it-all. You don't want to be self-indulgent. But at the same time, again, it's my out. You want balance. You want some balance in that bad boy. And so uh, you need a good, healthy ego. Everybody needs a good health. Any psychologist would tell you it's important for an individual to have and possess a good, healthy ego. Anybody that tells you your ego is too strong, I would challenge that person. Because you're going to take away, I mean, when a person has confidence, you know, every athlete would tell you, especially like you're a single athlete, like a boxer, you're in that ring by yourself. They tell you have some confidence. You go into the ring to do a fight. Well, I mean, it's a scrap, man. It's some serious outlay of energy. And it's just you performing. Everybody would tell you you don't want to go in there with your head all bowed down with no confidence. You want to believe that you can win that, that fight. And if you don't, you're going to, there's a good chance that the other person is going to feel confident against you. And they're going to feel encouraged. And they're going to fight you even harder because they, feel your, they can feel your countenance is down. They can feel that you don't, you're not exuding and showing that confidence. Now, what do you call that? Swag? You call it arrogance? You can call it whatever you want. But people who sit, seem to denounce that, I, I question people like that because on a, on the, it, it, what it does, it, it takes away person's confidence. Any momentum that that person could get going in life is instantly kind of like knocked down because they're accused of being a little bit on the arrogant side, a little bit on the, um, you know, vain side of things. Now, I'm not saying be vain. That's not what I'm saying. Not saying that at all. I'm just saying we should be uh, built up in our image of ourselves because the, the, we need it more, more so than anybody else because we've been so much, it's been so much taken away. Now, I'm not just saying just we as just in African-American people. Anybody who that image has been stricken down on, any person, it needs to be built back up. It should be built back up, I should say. It should be. Because, again, we want to put out strong people into society, people that can go out and feel confident about what they're doing. They can do a good job, a competent job. And even in the face and in the face of adversity, they're going to need that kind of um, confidence because there's so many things that will knock you backwards in life, that will take away your confidence, that will to set you off from your goal. You start out with these lofty goals. There's so many things that will take those things away. So why do we want to just focus on, you know, not having any confidence? It just don't seem like uh, that's what we should be promoting. seems like what we should be promoting is building confidence in people. Building that confidence, you know. Not destroying that confidence in people, but building it up. <clears throat> because confidence is, uh, you know, they call it in the military when you uh, morale. Anybody in the military would know that if you have these objectives to do, that's what you have. You have objectives. And if morale is low, the performance of that objective can be compromised or it could be lackluster. So if you want to actually achieve that objective with any kind of gusto, any kind of, um, you know, uh, success, you know, or... If you want some fluidity and ease of, uh, of, of achieving the objective, you want to make sure your morale is up. 
Your morale matches the task. That's very important. It's very important to have that morale matching the task that's at hand. Because if morale doesn't match the task that's at hand, what happens is um, you get lackluster performance. And the outcome is usually something less than what is ideal or what is expected or what is needed. And so when you're in extraordinary times, people need to be dealt with in extraordinary ways. Things need to be dealt with in extraordinary manners. Okay? So my, my quest for people is let's start trying to learn to build each other up. To build each other up. Always be positive towards each other. I see so many things on Facebook where they show that they just take their time to focus on somebody fighting. Somebody, the, 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 the ill side of people, the dumb people. Doing something stupid. You know, failing. You know, doing just, just failing, just messing up. And we're laughing at that like it's funny. And yes, it might be worth a chuckle, you know. But in the long run, it's quite sad. And all you're doing is contribute, contributing to the downfall of that group. That's what you're doing. You're contributing to the downfall of that particular group of people. You're not contributing towards the, the, the energizing or the upliftment of that group. You're contributing towards the backwards stumble of that group. Now, you take two steps forward to make one step, and, you, and sometimes you achieve one step backwards just by virtue of taking your two steps forward. Yes, I know how that works. You take your two steps forward, but in taking your two steps forward, sometimes what you achieve is also one step backwards, but you at least made one step forward. In the end, even though you got that one step backwards, the ultimate achievement was one step forward. That's how it's been in this country for certain groups of people. Now people can say, hey, I heard people say there's no progress has been made since the emancipation. That's, that's a false too. Because like I say, you could take three steps off the plantation back then and you was dead. And you could even do that all the way up to the 60s. You take three steps off of a certain area in your region, and you could literally lose your life. I mean, I, I'm going to just say it. I mean, I, I can go up to Northeast. I go to Pennsylvania, go to Philadelphia, Aramingo Avenue, and what's that other place called? Aramingo and uh, what's that other place called? Uh, Kensington. Go up through there in 1990s. <laughs> and see, don't you get jacked. <laughs> You might be able to still go in there now and get jacked. Could you please repeat what you said? That's what happened right now. There's certain neighborhoods in the Northeast. I dare you to go up in them. And I dare you to go up in there with some Black Panther kit on or some, some, some red, green, and black. That junk ain't going to end right. Okay? It ain't. But you don't want a dad going to try that because you don't. So it's not just it ain't going to end right if you went to certain places in the South. It ain't gonna end right if you go to certain places, but then you're asking for a fight, and I don't, I don't suggest that, because it's stupid hooking up with stupid, and I'm not, a, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not an advocate of that. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point that, that uh, there is progress has been made in a lot of places because that kind of thing was everywhere. It wasn't just with one group of people. It was with it was, it was prevalent throughout the country. Because if you look at newsreels, especially when people was getting elected, say for example, look at the Roosevelt. There's something that's done by Ken Burns, it's a film. And you go look at the footage of um, when FDR was, was running for president and, all, and, 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 uh, and Hoover before him. You ain't gonna see one black person in that group, like you saw with, with during Say, for example, Barack Obama, when he was running, or Trump. 
You ain't going to see one black person in, in, on the Democrat side or the Republican. Pick your side. You ain't going to see one. Okay, so that should tell you what it was like then. So have we made progress? You can clearly see from one. That's why I like looking at images. Because you can look at that, that footage and you can see clear as a bell where the black folks at. Now, there might not have been too many Hispanic people in the country at that moment. There might not have been too many uh, Asian people in the country at that moment. But they're showing up with some black folks there. Where they at? Well, they probably won't invite it to the party in the first place. They probably had the choir to go vote on voting day. But in terms of getting excited about who was the leader, that wasn't even an option. Now, I do know because I was at Barack Obama's inauguration. I do know a lot of people got excited about Barack Obama. And the funny part about Barack Obama was I saw just as many people from other countries they just came here. Now, the reason I know they were not just immigrants, but they were literally from other countries because they were speaking the language. Then I stopped and talked to them because they could speak English real good. And they said, we just can't believe that he got elected in your country. I'm sitting here, African American, I'm asking them. Oh, you can't believe it? I can't believe it either. We're sitting out in the freezing cold having this conversation with somebody from like Germany or somewhere in Europe, you know? And we just had to come to see for ourselves if this was really happening. And I said, yep, it's really happening, man. I voted for him. <laughs> and and uh, it was a lot of people on that lawn. It was just as many people on that lawn as it was during the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Because I saw the footage from that, and I was in the environment that was the environment of... Um, Barack Obama's inauguration. Okay, and then even during the political, some of the political campaigns, I was around some of the political stuff happened and drove right through my community. I saw the little caravan, of little cars where some people, white folks was raising money and black folks for Barack Obama. So would that have happened during the time of, uh, during the time of, uh, Franklin Roosevelt? No, heck no. Would any black people would have even been walking around at the convention with little signs to even say whether they they want to they like somebody or not? Heck no. You wouldn't even been there with a sign. You you know so just by virtue of being invited, <laughs> that's progress. When you say, well, you still didn't get anything, but that's not how political stuff works. It may it's popularity contest. That's like I say. You got to make yourself popular. You know, you got to make yourself the captain of the, of the football team. He's got to pre present himself as a leader. The captain of the football team is not just elected because, okay, let's get a little 90-pound weakling over there, a chance to be the captain of the team. No, that's not how it works. The 90-pound weakling is going to be the water boy. He's going to get the water for everybody, and you're going to tell him, hey, man, I'm thirsty. Can you give me some water? And you're not trying to put him down. But he can't run a touchdown. He can't catch a pass. He can't throw a block. But he can get your water for you. <laughs> you know? That's a fact. He can get that water. And that's his job, to get that water. Now, if you get a person who is actually qualified and can do a good job, then what you need to do is put him in front of some people so those same people that we saw, because we were at that party, and that party might not have worked out the way we wanted it to. Okay, let's get this guy, just like you did for Barack Obama. This is the guy we want. Put that money in, get that caravan, let's raise this money for him. We invited to the party now, see we're at the table. We're at the table. We weren't at the table during the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We weren't there, we just won't. You can look at the footage and see. I mean, at the footage, you don't need any documents. The footage tell you everything you need to know. We weren't there. Either people was too scared to come, they was going to get jacked up if they came. Who knows what was going to happen. But it ain't no daggone scenes where I see too many African Americans hanging around. Now, there's a couple of times or a few scenes where you see a few African Americans show up here and there. 
But by and large, when you put all the footage together and you look at it, like I say, uh, one, you know, the, 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 you know, everything was shot on film then. There was no video. So, you know, that's the film was expensive. It was precious, you know. So if they was going to shoot, it was going to be during the most important times. And so there may have been some African-Americans around here and there, you know, but they didn't see them as the most important people because they didn't shoot <laughs> in their little section. Whatever the case is, we invited to the table now. <clears throat> we at the table. Whether some people like it or not, we ain't going to ever leave that table. Now, it's important for the new generation to get their butts at the table. Get at the table. If you ain't at the table, you cannot, like I said, if you don't foul for your, rep you don't get yourself positioned to get your, uh, your relief check, you ain't going to get a relief check. You ain't. Okay? I'm going to say it one more time. If you don't foul and do the necessary steps to get it ready. Ain't nobody going to come to you and find you and say, oh, I have to make sure because you're African-American, I need to absolutely make sure you get your release check. That ain't how it's going to work. What you got to do is you got to do something to get that check. You got to make sure that your information, that your information, your voice, your information is put in the hat. Your number got to be put in the hat. The information got to be involved. You got to get involved. And then once you get involved, then somebody say, oh, John Doe, the African-American brother from Alabama, need to get his check. Or from the Bronx or from Detroit, bro, I need to get his check. And he been sitting there working at, he be working at McDonald's. He on the forefront. People got to eat. McDonald's is important. Yes, McDonald's is the forefront. I'm not saying that to be funny. I mean, those workers is feeding a lot of people because people just can't get to that grocery store anymore. You need the uh, people that's able to get that food prepared because if somebody goes out, especially if the person's 90 years old, they literally can't get to that food like that. So they might have to get that McDonald's burger until this is over with. That's really important for that person because otherwise, that person could die, literally. That might, it's a very strong chance that they could die if they went out into the grocery store arena and tried to shop. And especially if they didn't have, they've already ran out of their not, uh, N45 uh, respirator uh, mask. And they just, you know, that's going to be very important because there's a lot of people about 75 years old. They can still drive, but they can't, they don't want to go into, I know some people, I mean, one of my neighbors, what they're doing is they're going to fast food every day now because they're scared to go into uh, the grocery stores at their age. They literally are scared to go into the grocery store at that age. And the things they need to get is very, you know, they, they, they need to get butter. They need to get, you know, they got to mill over some stuff. You know, it's not like it's simple stuff. You just grab five things and get out, you know. And so uh, it's much easier for them to go to, you know, Long John Silver. Or, I don't know. Some of these little restaurants like this and get their little Happy Meal or whatever they're getting and push on down the trails. It's much easier for them to do that. So the people that's providing those kind of meals for them, that's saving people's lives, man. And so those people have to come to work every day. You know, it's, it's they're asked. People from McDonald's are not getting paid a dime more. Again, should you be getting your reparation check? I mean, your, uh, your COVID-19 check or whatever it is, or your relief check? Heck yeah. <laughs> I ain't say yeah, I said heck yeah. There's a big difference between yeah and heck yeah. <laughs> and why should you be getting your relief check? Because you earned it. You've been paying taxes. You've been, you, you're, you're, you're 35 years old and you've been working your job 
in and out on different jobs for 35 years. And for being an American citizen and being doing that for 35 years, you got to contribute to the success of your country by keeping everything float, by continuing to pay your rent, by continuing to go out there and even if you can't go out and shop, you can still go to the restaurants and buy stuff. You can still buy stuff off of Amazon. You can still do something to keep the money flowing, keep things going, but most importantly, to keep people safe, to keep people alive. You know, that's, that's where it's gonna start getting, that's where it's not starting. It's getting very important. You know, now for, for the people that's much well, better off, they don't have that same necessity. It's just not the same for them. But the people that's living in the cities where there might be a, a, a subway or a bus they have to get on, and that bus and subway might be filled with coronavirus, they might have to walk down that sidewalk to that McDonald's and get that daggone burger, man. And at least the sidewalk, they can put their mask on and get back to their apartment and feel like it's a pretty good chance I avoided this virus. So that's why people like that are very important. So, yes. But uh, at the same time, like I say, we need to uh, we need to take this as a re We need to improve our images in our community. Uh, our art images like these, as well as our images in our, religi uh, our, our religious spaces. Every black church, if you're going to be a Christian, please put a black Jesus up there. At least throw black Jesus up on the wall. <laughs> you know, put a picture of a black dude up there. Well, no, but we want to attract some white people. Ain't no white people coming in your black church. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say it again. Okay, you're going to get a couple of, maybe a, uh, a white woman who married a black dude. She going to come. Because she married to a black dude. She basically, in effect, defected on the white folks. They thrown her in the trash already, basically. I mean, that's what they do. I mean, that's what's happening. That's what happened to people. Now, some of the people in the family today, some of the, 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 the white families are not rejecting people. So I shouldn't say that about everybody. There's quite a few very good uh, white families is not doing that. So I should not say that. I don't want to say that because that, I just don't want to say that. That's wrong. However, <clears throat> a lot of times what used to happen, let's put it that way, in the old days, as from what I've seen, uh, if, if you're in a black church, that's, and I'm not talking about if you're in a black family, if you're in a black church, most likely, and you're white, most likely you're married to somebody who is black. Most likely. You're not going to see like a whole white family going to a historically, I mean, a church that's major with a black pastor, majority be black. You just, you might see that occasionally here and there with certain kind of pastors, black pastors. But by and large, our churches are the most segregated places in the country. That's basically what I'm trying to get down to. That's where the rubber hits the road right there. That's where the rubber hits the road. In that particular church, you're not going to see too many um, in, in, a, in, a, in a church where there's a white black pastor and say he's been there preaching for say like 30 years so say this guy's about in his 30s or 40s. You're just not going to see, for somebody in that particular demographic, you're not going to see a lot of parishioners who are Caucasian in this church. The predominant amount of people that's going to be at that church is going to be African, consider themselves African-American. And uh, why, out of all the places in America, the church is supposed to be the closest to God. I mean, that's what we they're supposed to have the divine vision of what's right. So why are those? Now, when you but the thing about it with black people is the opposite is true. If there's a white pastor, there's a very strong chance that the that he might have black parishioners. 
Because black people are tuned into the image of the white man as the leader. He could be their spiritual leader. He could be their whatever leader. They, it's programmed that way. So a black person don't have no problem following their, their part, their part that they take in that script. So we play, black people play just as much of a role in our own suppression and our own prejudice that's against us. We play just as big of a role than white people do. So we need to stop blaming white people, I think, to some level. We need to we need to address those blacks that's not aware that's what they're doing. They play just as big of a role in their own image development or lack of development than whites do for not allowing that to get developed way back in the day. Well, there's no reason now. That stuff is long over with. There's absolutely no reason other than the fact we just got lazy. We got passive and we've forgotten the struggles of the people of the past. We literally have forgotten that. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the second layer, I'm switching it to Stoptic now on the um, on my main layer, on the legs here. And you know, like I said, I, I tend to build stuff, especially skin textures. I have an underpaint, is what you saw before. And what I tend to do is go in with a series of kind of like glazes, I, I would call them glazes. And then what I do with those glazes is I begin to tone with those glazes. In other words, I would just add certain colors to lighten and darken certain areas until they reach the, uh, until they get to the, uh, the value color-wise, uh, saturation-wise, tone-wise, and of course, uh, value-wise in terms of light and dark that I want until they reach that exact spot. And so that's what I'm doing now. You can see I'm going into, for example, I'm going into this calf. And so you can see I have a hard line right there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just drop down that hardness right there. Just smooth it out so it's not so hard. And just kind of massage that tone right on in there. Now, like I say, just you little, since I do have my core layer, these could these layers could be fairly thin and wispy layers. Just with a just just enough pigment to shift the, the tone a little bit. So that you see some undertone underneath. And so I'm mixing these colors, but I really don't have to use as much paint. At this stage of the game, I don't. I can just put in the amount that I need to get that blend to start happening, then make it happen. So I don't have to keep, like before, you saw me just recharging my palette, just put more paint on, put more paint on. At this level, I really don't have to do that as much. What I'm doing now is just kind of um, just getting the tones a little bit better, nicer, smooth in, sort of, a little bit more subtle, not as abrupt. Still keeping it fairly somewhat gestural at this point because there's much, there's more layers I can put on. I can put it on layers to my heart's content. As many as I want. I mean, especially for something like this, is a big giant leg. It's a lot of area to cover. You can have a lot of fun painting on this in terms of just hitting it with different subsequent tones and colors in the skin complexion. You know, you can just do a little lesson in blending and lesson in tones and 
how many values you can put in the skin color to make it a certain way, uh, brush stroke uh, lessons in terms of how you want your brush strokes to go. You can even experiment with some finger technique like you see me doing now. <laughs> I like the finger technique. Okay? Uh, I mean, there's a plethora of things that can be done. Okay, and of course, just that quick, the legs look different than they did when I first started. Well, slightly different anyway. I can't tell how much different they look. And then, of course, unless you can play the video back, of course, it's live, so you probably can't. You probably can't really tell the difference either. <laughs> But a lot of times afterward, I'll ask you guys to go ahead and play them back. You can kind of see how things are evolving, you know, and working with various tones and images. Okay, so now I started out this painting doing this. Now this is something that could really wait because it's just the body tones, it's just skin tones. They could be adjusted any old time and it's mostly brown. So fairly easy colors to blend and adjust basically any old time. However, it's a good way to start out a painting. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is move from that a little bit. And let me just kind of um, hit this with a soft brush. So I need to soften this up some. Don't need that to be so harsh. Okay, good. Okay, so now I think I got the legs a little bit more modeled, closer to the way I want. Not quite there yet, but getting there. Um, I got this really strong light line on this side of the leg. I don't really need that there. So I'm gonna go ahead and just deal with that right now while I got a chance too bright. I can knock that down quite a bit. But like I said, once you have an undercoat coat there, very easy to take care of those kind of things. basically kind of making that a lot less pronounced like I want. Okay, great. That looks good. I like that. All right. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the, uh, to the bird's head a little bit. And uh, this is the part where, and I am, uh, I, I thought I would get the uh, stop animation for my, for this painting over here, my Haru on the Throne painting. I wasn't able to finish editing that today. Tomorrow I should be finished and I should have it uploaded by tomorrow. Or maybe later on tonight, around 10 o'clock, I have that uploaded. And I might premiere that, I might just, I might premiere it in the morning I might just upload it um, later on, you know. But um, it's coming along. It's getting better. It's getting better and better and better and more better. Um, there's a lot more things that I see that needs to be done. But for right now, 
it's coming along pretty good. So I'm gonna let it go sort of as it's going. I'm gonna test this yellow area. On this area behind this collar that should be yellow, I'm actually gonna test this turquoise area to see if it's dry. And it's almost completely dry. And uh, But I think I want it to be bone dry, so I'm gonna give it one more 24 hour period before I deal with that. <clears throat> My falcon up there needs some help. <laughs> so I'm gonna eventually give him some help, but for right now, he's not getting much help. But I think I wanna blend that, that area around the sun. It's bothering me a little bit. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just, um, I'm gonna go ahead and work with that. Um, let me see if I can get a new, another brush for it. Clean brush. And I'm gonna pull this out of the way because I have some blue around the sun. I don't know if you can even see it from there. Let me look on the camera to see. I don't think you guys can see the blue is there. But I think it's making a little bit of an effect. I don't know. But it's bothering me. I don't want it there. <clears throat> I'm going to take it off. And this is the great thing. Like I can say once you get your... You're not painting on gesso anymore, but you paint oil on oil. The next oil layers that go in just go in so much better. They just go in so much better. It just feels smoother, it covers better. And when you get to toning things, when you're really trying to nail a tone, you know, that's why I don't even try to get the tone on the first go. I mean, in acrylic, I think you could do that because the paints dry so fast. I think you could do it a little bit better in acrylics. But acrylics, they dry so fast, I think you miss it. A lot of times, artists miss it because it's drying so freaking fast. So, you know, it is a, it is a bit of a uh, challenge, you know. On the one hand, it's drying fast, and then on the other hand, it's, uh, On the other hand, it's not drying fast enough. You know, it's like, uh, I'm gonna create a little bit more pop with the falcon face there. Just a little bit more pop in that. Get the pop away a little bit better. Let's get that established. Of course, I'm gonna paint it better first, but again, what I try to do at this level is get the tones exactly where I need them to go. You know, tones need to be now, I just painted this yesterday. I just want to see 
how this color is setting up. Some places is nice, some places is not. So I'm gonna give that another day too. Okay. So basically what I'm doing now is establishing what I can paint and what I can't paint. Uh, for some reason in my studio, the tones should seem to be drying a little bit slower than what they would, but nonetheless, they, they are drying. So that's good. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on some of the areas I didn't focus on that might be dry. I mean, I have so much out of space in this picture here that I could address. But I'm going to address first the chair. Then I'm going to start working with some of this meticulous stuff down here because this should be dry. And then I'm going to work on that blue field and outer space up there to get that more mystic looking. And I'm not going to really go into his feathers just yet. Um, I'm going to wait a little bit more, at least later into the session today. Uh, I'm, I probably get into this pedestal just a little bit more, try to sharpen some of that up. But I think what I'm going to do is get into his chair, his throne more. I'm going to get into his face more. And then I'm going to get into this pattern down here and the blue up there. And for some reason, things to keep telling me, work on the uh, blue up the top more. Uh, I don't know yet. Don't know yet. I'm still, still looking and seeing. Still looking and seeing. And trying to figure out what I'm doing. Let's see who's in the room. Okay, just trying to see what I'm doing here in terms of what I should tackle. You know what? I'm going to tackle the uh, blue up the top next just to get that modeling going because it's a big field. It's going to take a while to dry. And it's kind of like it's not the tone of blue that I want. And I do have a lot of blue on the palette. It's going to require bigger brushes, so I'm going to get those out. But it is what needs to get dealt with right now. And I might need real big brushes. I don't know. But I'm just going to get out what I think I need. And see about it. Now, it just needs to be toned in certain places. Because uh, right now that blue looks nice up there, but it's not the tones that I'm really, really after. And it's, if this can start taking on, I don't wanna to use too big of a brush. I'm gonna use this one here. It needs to start taking on the tones that I originally intended it to have. And my, already my medium is starting to get a little bit dirty, so I might as well start working in the blues. So what I'm gonna do is I do want a rich blue color. This is gonna really tap into my blue. And I'm gonna just start with ultramarine blue Basically, I got ultramarine blue up here, and what's happening is there is another coat of ultramarine blue going on top of that, and I just want to see what that does. You see how when your second layer comes in, and the first layer is covering nicely. I mean, it's just this is what happens when you have a second layer, and this second layer is not put on really, really thick. It's like I say, is that is that nice. Uh, uh, layering thing where you have a you know I have the same mixture of uh, oil in the paint but it's a thin layer so the whole idea here is to put on subsequent layers and I may want to try a big brush I'm gonna see what it looks like with this brush and I may have to go with this one oh yeah that's riching it up nice but I need a more better tone and I might have to go with a bigger brush so already I know I'm going to need some more ultramarine blue. And I do like the, the tone that's there, but it's too blue still. It's too blue, and I need to hit it probably with some... Um, I'm going to stick with this brush because I'm still mixing. And I'm going to hit it with a little didoxin on purple to darken it. I'm not going to hit it with Mars Black to darken it. And really, I'm going to start with this corner because I see this in terms of the feel of black or the feel of space. I see this corner as the darkest part of that, that space. And the whole idea with this is 
I'm just trying to get a little bit of purple, the doxazine purple mixed with ultramarine blue. Because I do want it to have color. I do want it to have tone, but I want see that. Oh, that looks rich right there. Oh, that's nice. Okay, let's look for some more purple. And that's what I want. I don't want so much ultramarine. I do want the purple. That's giving me what I want. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Okay. So this is what happens when, you know, an artist makes good per color. At least what I do when I use good color. I really, really like it. Okay, so I'm got, I got a lot of medium that I'm throwing in here, and I probably got to mix some more medium. And I'm going to carry this color over a little bit towards the middle of the painting. And I'm just going to try to cover this top three or so inches or so, and then sit back and see how that color is doing. See how that tone is that I just added in there. And I really, really like that tone. I like that purple mixed with the blue. Okay, so that's going to be happening a lot more. So I already know that I'm going to have to mix some more medium. And I'm going to need a lot of medium now because this is a big field. And I probably shouldn't mess with these little cups. So uh, if I'm going to do this, it's going to be a lot of this color. So I'm going to have to get a standalone cup here. It's not knocking that over that's going to have that medium in it. So let me go to my storage and get put that medium in it. Okay, a lot of times when I do have a cup, I'm going to mix a lot of medium to cover a big background like this. What I do is I uh, get a old um, plastic container like this. I cut it down so I can get good access. So I really don't need this deep of a container. All I need is about an inch or so. You know? That's about all I need there. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a little medium in there. Whoa! Don't want to do that. But since I'm going to mix a lot of this color anyway, I'm going to take the brush, get it off, scrape that on because I'm going to mix this in with, with the color anyway. Now, let me just take an exacto knife. I mean, a Palette knife, scrape it off and get it in there. Then I'm going to mix quite a hefty amount of this Galkit in. I think what I'm also going to do for this, because I don't know if I, how much I'm going to be hitting this, I'm going to mix a little bit of the linseed oil in as well. And I have this really slow drying stand oil stuff here. I don't want that. That's too slow drying. But I am going to use this linseed oil. And I'm going to go back to my other mixture because I want this to dry a little bit slower so I can mix in yet another color to still be tacky. Because I might not even get to this thing for another two or three days. I might not even get to it after I work on it today. But at the same time, I don't want it too, too. That's it, I'm gonna just leave it like that. What I have right now is about half and half. Actually, I have more linseed than I have of Galkit, and that's okay, that's fine. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix in the Gamsol and uh, Go with a little bit more gam salt than that. First, I like to pour my gam salt in here. Then, for there, I put it in here. So I can, I don't really like having this big container out all the time. 
Okay, and then I'm gonna mix this up. And again, this is about 50% Gamsol. And about, uh, I guess about 30% linseed oil and 20% Galca. And what I might do is mix a little bit because I do want this to be kind of silky, satiny. So what I might do with this particular mixture is mix a little bit of more Galca in it. And it takes a little bit longer actually to blend the mixture with the Galca than it does with the linseed. The linseed breaks down very, very quickly in this mixture. The galcate mixed down very, very slowly in this mixture. So that's something that we should be aware of. And I think I need a little bit more galcate in here because I think it's going to be a little bit too flat. I mean, I want to have, I mean, it's not going to be flat, but it's going to be a little too satiny. I want to have a little bit more satiny or a little bit more gloss to the satin, let's put it that way. Because this is going to be a feel in the background, so I'm just going to add a little bit more. That's it. And with my baby spoon, I'm going to mix this up. Really nice. Because this is going to be basically, I'm going to paint, I'm not even going to paint out the palette anymore because I've already discovered the color that I want all over that blue. Especially certain areas around underneath the sun, behind his head, in that top corner. I already know the mixture that I want. So now what I'm going to do is start mixing in ultramarine blue and the Daxit on purple. And I probably want a heavier dose. And I'm basically now going to blend this into all of this because I'm going to make a big helping of this color, which means I'm going to put a lot more... I'm going to put a lot more um, <clears throat> pigment in here. Uh, not just what's on everything on my palette. I'll put a little bit more Daxodon purple in there. Quite a bit more. Which probably means i got to now get a tube in the next two weeks of that. At least a 150 milliliter tube. And what I'm going to do is just blend that in. And so basically what I'm doing is mixing this solution, the medium in with the paint before I even put it on a palette or before I even put it on the canvas at all. And I still have some of this ultramarine on my palette. And so, and this is older ultramarine, so I want to use before I start getting any new ultramarine out of the um, out of the tube. And what I'm going to do with this, and I'm going to take the, the main brush I'm going to use to paint with this and I'm going to start mixing with it just like I would mix my colors on the palette with a brush. A lot of people mix their palettes mostly with the um, palette knife. I do, but I usually mix my palettes, my colors with a brush. Because a lot of times I'm doing very specific colors. And I'm looking for a certain consistency out of this, by the way. I don't want to be really swimmy and watery. And I might have just put too much Gamsol in here. Or sometimes you can just underestimate the amount of um, the amount of material you need to. I think I have the right amount. But I'm just going to kind of do the drip test, see how fast it drips off my brush. When I pull it out, that drips rather quickly. So now that I got most of it off my palette, I'm going to go back to my ultramarine, drop a, a hefty load of that in here. But then I'm going to go right back down to my Daxon on purple, because I do have a lot to cover. I'm going to drop a hefty load of that in as well. So I'm putting in some serious pigment here. You know, I'm putting about I'm not going to say $50 for, for pigment, but let's just say about $40 for, for pigment. It's going to ultimately go into the, just the background alone. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the funk here. And I'm just going to kind of sit this up so I can kind of look over as a reference. But I don't need this anymore because I'm just going to use the force where I want this to go. 
And right now, this is going over that nice blue ultramarine block color that I already have in. I know I want to go over this wing with that tone. So I'm going to go over this wing really nice. Again, I have it already thinned out to exactly what I want. Is it a little bit too thin? I'm testing it now to see if it's too thin or not. And, uh, <clears throat> and you want a good thorough mix so you can tell if it's too thin or not. A lot of times with these, the more you work it, the thicker it starts to get on you. So you can start out with it perfect and then by the time you finish painting, it's too thick. And I like that. I'm going to put a little bit more ultramarine in there. A little bit of purple because I don't want it to be too thin. I think this is going to give it... I'm going to stick with this brush because I'm able to put the tone exactly where I want it. Now this is... What I'm doing is by having so much medium in this, I'm making it somewhat transparent. So I am painting... What you're seeing is this is a good example of the fact of layering. You see how just layering, you can still see the original blue color underneath this purplish blue color that I'm laying in here. And this purplish blue color is somewhat thin. It is somewhat thin. And uh, however, I do have sections in this little cup where it does get a little bit thicker, but I kind of know I want it thicker or close to this wing and further from the wing. So I do have need to have a thicker amount of it here and there. But this brush is loaded pretty good right now. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come right, just kind of trim this wing a little bit. And I'm going to just start feathering it out into this. And I'm going to smooth over this little star thing here that I have. So it can look a little bit more round because I don't want it to be that kind of a bubble shape like that. And now what I'm doing is just seeing how it looks if I scumble it out into some of the blue that's already there. And scumble it even into this to create kind of like something like, you know, create different volumes you know, in the sky. Okay. Okay, so let's see how that's working out. Yeah, that's looking nice. We're starting to get a little bit of a, something special is starting to happen. And now I think this area right here doesn't need to be so light because I need a dominant side. I need a, a side of this canvas to really be darker. And so this is going to be the side that's going to be darker. I still can do some things with, you know, it's still enough. I don't, again, I don't want my paint to be wispy. I don't want to have a little wispy. Oh, that's ultramarine blue. I don't want nobody to see the color like that. Because when you layer it like this, you're not going to just see ultramarine blue. You're not going to see dioxin on purple. You're going to see layer after layer after layer, slightly different colors, all intermingle and overtop each other in such a way that they become one, but they're jewel-like. You know, it's kind of like an opal, but not quite as obvious as an opal. You know, but you know how you see all those little different colors in the opal. This is what you're kind of sort of going to have with this feel right here. So now I'm going to back off from it. And it's kind of hard sometimes you come over off of the box. Because I want to get away so quick to see what I've done. Because I'm so close because I'm up on that box. And that's why you have these nice little brushes like this. With these handles. But just this. And that's for the people that little easels. This is for a big easel. These brushes are for. You can just have them little small handle brushes. You got a little easel. I think guys just like posing because they saw some artists take a picture back in the day posing with a big with a big brush. And that's probably was a guy like uh, Velasquez who was working on something big 
and then somebody was imitating him, and then the person imitate that one and imitates the other one. This is a this is a big brush technique right here. Okay, so now that's looking pretty good. I'm liking that. And I'm gonna take some of this darker tone, even right around this part of the wing here. You know, like I say, ooh, it's still white. Uh, I didn't realize that would be still wet like that, or that wet. So what I wind up doing was accidentally picked up some white in there. And this is why I like it to be dry. However, that's kind of messing with my stuff a little bit. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just finger blend that in and step off of it. <laughs> I don't want to mess nothing up. Got to wait till that dries. That's just all to it. But at least I got a little bit of different tone in there. Now, underneath this wing, it's starting to look flat because I painted some stuff that just don't look as good as the ultramarine under that. So that's going to get dealt with right now. And that color is different from the color that I painted up top. This color might even still be partially wet also. But I do need to deal with that because that don't look good. This this tone that I put on, right under this wing, this lighter tone. I mean, I think I didn't even have any. I think I was just using Gamsol. Now that I have the right amount of, I have linseed oil plus I have galcate oil in my Gamsol now. You see, I have about 50% Gamsol, but that's just to get it so it's running. And once, uh, what, what do we call it? We don't call it running, we call it to have it, uh, to have the viscosity up. So, you know, you want to have, um, you know, you want to have high ohesion. And then you want to have, you know, low viscosity, <clears throat> you know? And so that's what we're looking for. And uh, so actually this is going to be high viscosity with also high adhesion. Well, I have quite a bit of linseed, I mean, a little high gamsol in there. So the adhesion is fairly moderate, I should say, moderate adhesion here. But it doesn't matter because I already have a, a base layer. The adhesion doesn't have to be really, really tremendous right here. And this is a beautiful color going over top of that other already fantastic color that I have there. Now I'm going to start scumbling this in because I have like a blue mixed with greens, with Viridian green, mixed with uh, cobalt. Uh, blue mixed with uh, ultramarine mixed with uh, a lot of stuff. And now I'm coming in here with this rather that dioxidine purple mixed with ultramarine. Kind of just doing a little something right here. And what I'm doing is just I want my the whole perimeter to be somewhat dark. I want the, the eye to kind of go in. So I don't want everything to be so light on the edges. I want my edges to really have a lot of very true tone. And as you already know, I do paint my sides. And so here you get to see me again, yet again, painting the sides of the canvas. Because again, my philosophy is if you're walking up, you haven't seen the painting yet, or maybe you kind of glimpse a little bit of it, you want to get a better view. So if you walk in from the side of the room and it's coming up to the painting, you want to see a nice, if, if it's not framed, you want to see a nice side of the painting as well. And again, I layer this side. I layer the sides just like I layer the front. I treat this almost the same as actually I treat the front of the canvas. I treat it almost just about the same. Because, um, Again, it should be uniform. It should not go down just because you get on the side and then 
I don't like to see the white on the sides. Now, I do have some of my older paintings. You're going to see white on the sides. <laughs> you know, but I graduated off of that a while ago. And, uh, and I'm at the point now where I paint all my sides of my paintings. So that you don't see any white. And I still, I layer the sides just like you see me laying the front with paint. <clears throat> So that looks good from the side. Now on this one, I think I did the sides later, but you see me on this one right from the very beginning, you see me hitting the sides, you know? I've already hit the sides once. This is the second coat to make everything uniform that I'm doing on the sides. I'm just doing it now just so I don't forget <laughs> to get the sides and not just up top, but at bottom too. Okay. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is try to follow where I want that darker tone to go. And I want this darker tone to kind of creep in towards where the body is. Because I don't want it to be so blue and wispy. I do want him to kind of come out of the darkness, so to speak. And I want him, the character itself, to kind of pop to some level. So in order to get that, it's going to be necessary for me to continue this um, darker tone here all the way almost right underneath this little wing here. And I'm just going to get this darker tone kind of going even here just so it can have a bigger space underneath the wing. Then I'm just going to kind of, um, don't need, you know, I'm just, these are just little thin layers that I'm putting down. I like to put down like this, you know, again, these layers can be painted back and forward to any, oops. And even on my little chalice there, I still have some wet white, sometimes white. So I want to take his time to dry. You just got to wait on it, dog on it. Or else you're going to get it bleed into other colors when you really want those colors to be wet on dry. You don't necessarily want those colors to be where you're painting wet on wet. Especially when you're trying to layer. You know, you want at least that bottom layer to be tacky. But in this case, the bottom layer for most of this blue is dry. And it's creating a nice piece of pigment on this canvas. Now I'm going to step back because i got a lot of that tone built in now. And so that blue should be a lot richer now. Yeah, that's richer. So it's changing the way the painting looks to some level. Now there's some shine on it too, maybe in your camera. And, uh, and also what's happening as it goes through the top, it's starting to look like there is a cloud right through there. So... I don't know if I want that cloud through there. So I'm gonna use this tone to kind of, and this one I'm just gonna really dry brush in because I already have toned down, so I don't need it so, so thick. I just need it to kind of knock down a shade or two. Just need to knock down a shade or two. So I'm gonna paint the top edge See how far I want that. Actually, I want this to go all the way over to here. So I'm going to take it all the way over. <clears throat> take it all the way over there. Just close this thing, whole thing off with tone. But I'm going to drop this tone down about here. Drop it down just a smidge. Drop it down, and that's it. That's all I'm gonna drop it for now. But when we get about here, right in this darkness right around the sun, I want the sun to pop more. So I'm gonna just dry brush some tone right in around the sun. 
just so that sun can get a little bit of more poppiness, but not everywhere, just at the top left side of it, around 10 o'clock. And I might have to go back in here with another tone and hit this again and maybe even, because a lot of times after you darken something, what do you do? You come back in and you lighten it, you know? And you go back and forward until you get it just the way you want. At least that's the way I paint it, you know? Because I want to try different things. How can you try something if you go in and deliberately paint it exactly this way? That's the way it's got to be. That's the way I see it. That's the way I saw it. And you don't, and when you see it this big, I mean, this is a huge canvas. So when you see it this big, it's going to impress you a different way. And you always can paint it the way you have originally designed it. You always can do it, but it, it, you deserve the right to be able to see it a different way, this big. And see if that's something you like. And if you don't, like I said, you can always go back to plan A, you know? But if you never conceive of plan B, no, you don't even have a concept at all because you never allowed that a chance. And that's what you're always doing as an artist. But just me, when I go about my paintings, I'm always looking for different alternatives to express the same idea that I had before. Okay, how many different ways can I say the same thing? You know, is that a bad thing? You know? Because I'm trying not to hit that chalice with this big old brush here. So I'm going all over the place with this brush. Because I want to kind of create that all over the place look with this. Okay, so that's pretty good. Now, also just to add a little bit more depth. Because I got quite a bit of blue. And see, like I say, not all of this wing has dried. So... I can still hit this later with more subsequent layers, but to add a little bit of depth underneath this little comet burst, that should kind of go into the picture more too. So since I'm dealing with that, and that paint does look wispy right there, it's already there, so I might I know I gotta cover that because that's some wispy wimpy paint right there. And when you're up close, like I say, it has to look good up close as well as far away. So we don't want it to look wispy. So what I'm gonna do right away is go in here with a darker tone, with this nice dioxazine purple mixed with ultramarine blue. And it's really almost creating a black effect because it's just so dark. It gives the eye the impression. And what I'm gonna do now is just scumble it in some areas. I'm not even gonna paint it in, I'm just gonna scumble it in just to create like a uh, kind of almost creates like an airbrush look when it's tone on top of tone now when it's tone on white it just looks like scumble brush <laughs> and that's why i don't like the paint on white i like to paint on my underpaint if you if you don't paint on underpaint it's not going to look like airbrush it's going to look like scumble brush which personally i don't particularly like that effect <laughs> in my paintings. Some people, that's what they do, that's what they know how to do, and that's what they want, so they do it. And maybe that's all they know, you know, but I don't like that. Okay, so now I kinda got a little bit more darkness in that. I'm coming to the other side, because I like this tone. The purple, I mean, the blue is nice, but this is nicer. And I'm gonna look, I got my water bottle block in my example. Of course, I'm looking for them from a distance. But like I said, I'm also using the force on this to some level as well. And I'm just really just putting a tone over top of our, an existing block tone color. And of course, I'm starting to build up my layers. That's basically what I'm doing here. I'm starting to build up these layers so it looks pretty. So it looks pretty. And um, also, by doing this, it's going to cause these wings, 
before I start building the wings, because they need to dry some. I need to let these wings set up another 24 hours at least, maybe in 48 hours. So before I deal with these wings, there's some drying that needs to get down with this thing. So I might as well deal with the first area that I painted like three days ago, which is this background. Because that's 72 hours plus, yeah, that, that, that's 72, well, at this point, you know, uh, 84 hours. That's given this, of, of this paint basically oxidizing. It's giving me an opportunity to uh, get this paint nice and rich. And I mean, this just set up and dry. So I can paint wet onto dry. And I can just paint nice and easily onto my base layer, my block layer. And that's very nice. Now I can scumble this, but this is a lighter color to scumble. So what I have a tendency to do with these lighter colors is to go ahead and mix it, mix the paint and not try to do it through scumbling. Okay, so now um, also on the top of raw, I don't want this kind of purplish color. I do want the purplish color around where I was painting earlier. And I'm gonna scumble that to some, oops, I'm messing up now. Cause I came in there just a little bit too wet paint was just a little bit too wet but I do want to kind of get in here kind of tight on this image and I want this to kind of um, be like right here I really should have started it here I'm gonna just drag some of this tone more around here because that's really why I want this tone to exist it's right around there and then I'm going to kind of stop this color right there I think I might even bring some of this color and I'm not gonna I'm just gonna pull some of this color up because I got too much there I think I'm gonna take it right down this wing some just a little bit just get a little ridge of that tone in there right underneath that wing I'm gonna add a little of this tone in this negative space too because this has some good medium in it I just want to kind of get that on that color there. So now, when it gets over that space, I'm going to switch brushes. I'm going to put this down because I actually mixed too much, but it's okay because I can always let that get a little bit tackier or I can just go back in like this because that layer is up, but even with this is wet, I can still, because that's so syrupy, that syrup has gotten thicker since I first picked it up. It's literally like painting on some thin syrup. I can hit it again and just make an even richer purplish color. That color looks so nice. Of course, right now it might look a little shiny because it's wet. But once that's set up, that's going to be tight. That's going to be nice. And I don't want it to be so like one way or another because I'm switching up my brush strokes so that the paint doesn't look one way or the next, you know? But basically, sort of like some type of nebula, some kind of undulation of tone that's going into space. Of course, now what I can do is hit this with some black at any later date or any underpainting level. But for right now, I'd rather hit it with multiple dark colors to create the illusion of black. Because, you know, that's basically what black is. I'm just going to blend this dark tone nicely to get a nice, flat, smooth, beautiful, rich color as many places, I mean everywhere, I think that rich color needs to exist. Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right, so now as I go above the raw character. I'll put away any brush. Well, I already started on this brush, so I'm gonna separate some brushes. I don't wanna get anything dirty, so I'm just gonna drop that in there. 
I'm gonna pick a smaller brush, something that's not too small, I hope. I think I already started to use this one and this one, so let me drop this there. And um, I am gonna have to paint some intricate little spaces here, so let me find a good brush for doing that. It don't have to be really, really intricate, but there is some, it is some stuff, so, but at the same time, I got to cover some space, so it's got to be the right brush. And I think this is going to be the brush here, which is a filber brush. It's my number one filber Winsor Newton brush. Okay, for this, I'm going to get mixed right above raw. That dust cloud is going to get a little, like, dusty brown, ready kind of color in it. So... For that, I'm gonna mix a little, uh, I'll go back to my palette. I'll put a little bit of ultramarine blue back on because all of it's gone. I still have right much Viridian. Now I'm not gonna really need that much because it's just a tone in that nebula. And that tone was gonna to get warm somewhere up in here. So I'm gonna come in here and I don't want too much dark and muddy. I do want it more uh, I do want it more alizarin. So I'm going to go like right in here with this alizarin color. Right kind of right, right between the white and the blue. And the paint that's on here in this area is not very thick at this level. So it, it still feels on my brush kind of canvassy. But of course... Uh, I'm going here and I'm, I'm attacking this thing with a little bit more tone now. So it's going to get less and less canvassy. Okay, and I'm going to bring that tone a little bit. Create this little kind of dust cloud going in here. But I want the remnants of this dust cloud to have a little, like a, a you know, just to be dusty. You know, like it's like a, it's a different color. It's in the foreground for the darker blues colors that's in the um, is in a deep space background so I'm picking up some alizarin and it is getting a little bit of uh, ultramarine blended in with it I'm not trying to get too much of that just to kind of dirty it a little bit but I don't want it too dirty but I'm trying to stick mostly with alizarin as I'm going around this and now now that I'm kind of around I'm going to push it all the way to the edge. Right all the way to that wing right there. Okay, now that I have that, I have it kind of in place like I like it. Now I'm just going to blend it with the white. So I'm going to get a white brush. And I'm going to get a number, uh, I think this is a number um, two or four round. And I'm going to hit it with some, um, with some, uh, a little bit of medium. And uh, I'm just going to come right, because this, this is wet. Most of this is wet that I have up here. I mean, it's dry. I'm sorry. Most of this is dry. So with this white color, I'm just going to come in with this wet tone. Again, this is a thin layer right over top that dry layer. And I do have purple mixed in it in that um <clears throat> in the dry layer it's white mixed with the dioxide on purple and so now it's uh alizarin with a little bit of white mixed in it and what i'm going to do is i just want like i say i don't want to i'm putting it on somewhat opaque because i know i'm going to blend it and thin it out with another brush but I want this bristle brush so I can just scumble it in exactly and put the paint exactly where I want it. And uh, I don't want the alizarin on the outside because I want it to blend with that purple, that dark blue that I already put up. So I'm just getting a little bit of the white and I'm just kind of following the inside of this to some level. Mixing it with a little bit of medium, mostly with the white pigment. 
but I just want a little bit of medium to give it a little bit of satiny, you know, it's a little bit of something there. Okay, now that I have that kind of in there, I'm going to get my blend brush. I'm going to get the blending on it. And I'm first start out right between the two colors. And I'm just going to kind of just go and just smooth them over to create like a middle tone in the middle between those two colors. Okay, just create that nice little middle tone there. All the way around. And including underneath. <coughs> <coughs> I have enough medium mixed in there to allow this blend to happen really, really easily. So that's good. All right, so now that's pretty good. So now I got a nice little blend there. Now what I'm gonna do is just get, just tap this blend brush with a little bit of the white. Not really trying to pick up too much medium and the whole idea is to scumble this end part. Now I am scumbling and this is gonna put some like, some dusty dirt here into it into that white. It's all, some of it's dry, some of it's not so dry. But I'm picking up mostly white, but I'm using a dirty brush also. And it's kind of creating a little bit of a dirty effect there. And kind of vignetting that red into the white. Again, I'm just picking up straight white. And the whole idea now, which is using this soft sable hair, large blend brush, just want to mix it in just a little something. Okay. Now once I kind of get that going, I'm going to wipe this brush off. And I'm going to go now to that purplish color that I had there. Now just to make sure this stays dark, I'm going to just put a little bit of ivory black in it. I'm just going to put a little bit of lizard in it just because it's kin to that one. But mostly blue. I might even try a little bit of dioxane purple. Now I'm gonna go between the purple color and I'm gonna hit that, hit that lizard crimson and blend that into that blue color. And I'm gonna do the same thing down here. Now I don't have that much of that blue down here <clears throat> and I don't really want it because I do want that really nice cerulean blue there. This time this one is not gonna blend into Ultramarine blue is going to blend into cerulean blue. Okay, now what I'm going to do is start picking up this red and I'm just going to put it on this side of the wing. I'm going to pick up existing paint that's on the canvas already. So I know the color is already blended and I'm going to carry that color to this side of the wing. Just pick it up and just go over here with it. I'm not using the palette at all. I'm just going to this side because I want that dirty dust from this to be reflected over here. And if I already got the dirty dust mixed, I don't have to mix it on a palette. It's here and I know it's going to match because I'm taking it from there. So I don't have to make sure it matches. It's going to match. And I'm just going to cover the entire upper body. And it's mixing a little bit with this blue and I don't mind. If that color mixes with the blue a little bit because it's supposed to be dirty. And I'm going to take this all the way over. And I'm going to cover some of this blue and some of this white with this burgundy. Well, not burgundy. I am going to hit it now with just a little bit of um, cerulean right there. Just so it can have, don't get too gray and muddy on me. As I'm getting further away from the other colors that I'm blending with. And I'm blending into that cerulean blue now. It's a blend between cobalt and cerulean. And of course, this new, I'm now also now blending. In, oh, I picked up some of that white. And that's okay because that might be a little burst of light right there in there. I'm just gonna soften it, tap it down. That, that'll work. Because it's just a it's just a dust burst at this level. And dust bursts are random, so that helps the randomness of it. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at that dust burst and see how that's doing. And since I picked up some of that white, I see a lot of that tone right there. Matter of fact, I see a lot of that. It's going to appear 
little bit of white cloud appearing right here on this side of the wing. Just a little bit of that. As a matter of fact, what's going on there? I might want some more of that right there. Yeah, that's looking good. Of course, what I'm doing is, is I'm just scattering this dust burst like dust does all over the place. Okay. Now I'm going to back up off of it. I'm going to kind of go down here. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to just get this blend going down here better. Okay. I'm just using a little dapping kind of like a brush stroke here. That's looking pretty good. Same thing. I'm going to wipe my brush. I'm going to take that alizarin thing and I'm going to dap that to into the dry paint underneath of the cerulean blue just to soften that to make that look like misty dust I don't want it to look like paint I want it to look like misty dust and to do that you want to soften it down to dust dust does not have hard edges to it so we're going to take away those harder edges and I'm just going to let that fade into dust <clears throat> okay now for this again I'm going to take a dry brush basically I'm going to pick up this lighter tone. And as you can see, as we get to the body of the bird, there's going to be blue in there. And I probably have a little bit too much of this. So what I'm going to do is just fade this right now. Because I can always paint over this when it dries. But I'm going to just leave this the way it is for now. And just hit that hard edge on that dust cloud right there. Just hit it. We don't need any hard edge there. We don't need any streaks. We don't need anything too hard there. We just want a nice little dust cloud with the wispiness of this comet. It's kind of just flowing there. Okay. <clears throat> and creating a little bit of a burst of dust energy or some type of aura, gassy energy around him or something like that. As he's, it's like a little trail as he's going through space flying. We're creating that kind of energy around him. Okay. I'm gonna go into the white here because I don't want this one. I want this part so red. I want that to be more white. I'm just going back and forward now. And what I'm trying to do now is just soften down some of these lines now, some of these uh, gradations, just get them soft so they look like dust. I don't want anything hard here. I want everything nice and soft. Okay create this little burst effect here okay so that's starting to look pretty good and uh, yeah that's pretty good and I'm gonna kind of go in a little bit more I'm gonna get some more medium I'm not gonna pick up so much um, just a little bit of white mix with a little bit of that whatever is on my palette that's a little bit pinkish and I'm gonna kind of dry brush cloud this in to that white that I've already put back up earlier when I was clean white. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go add some white to that right here. Just so that doesn't turn. Don't want it too red. I want it too red, too quick, too soon. You know, I just want it to be dusty. But I do want it to have a burst of light from the sun there in it. <clears throat> okay. And again, I could change the colors, warm, move the values around at a later date but for right now I'm just modeling it to get it close to where I want it to be you know to establish the type of tones that I want in it okay not really trying to create anything to too many strong lines Really, I'm just trying to keep everything very, very soft at this level. Because it's a dust cloud. So dust cloud should be soft. 
I can even use my finger too. That helps with the cloud effect too. Okay, so now we got nice, nice cloud coming in there. As Ra is flying towards the sun. Ah, oh, yeah, that's starting to give that effect a little bit. Then you can see a little bit of that energy kind of wrap the cloud a little bit. So I'm kind of liking that too. Okay, so that's that's nice. Let me just keep it blended, keep it soft. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so we're just toning everything up where it needs tone. Again, I'm still looking at the overall composition. I'm not looking at anything specific at this level. Even though I finished the block level, I'm just looking at tone at this level. Now that I've done this bit of paint, I can see how this tone is needs to be scumbled better to blend with that. So that little bit of painting, I'm going to scumble this in a bit more because I can now see that scumbling better. Again, I don't want a hard edge here either. I want a softer edge right there. Okay, so now let's take a peek at it. And I like that. And not adding any more color, I'm just moving around what's already on here to kind of get everything kind of harmonized. Get everything kind of, uh, get the modeling, get the mood going here. Get the mood going. Now what I could do right there is I could add just uh, a very thin wash there. On this part, I don't want, I do want some tone. But what I did was I only used medium and what's on the brush to kind of get in this area here. Because again, I like the layer. I don't want to get rid of the cerulean, but at the same time, I do want a nice layer on there too. That's kind of nice. I'm gonna step away, take a peek at it. Now, what I'm gonna do is, because I like that, I don't want to mess up the cerulean, I'm going to get a brush and I'm going to pop back the cerulean in there. So I'm just going to get, I have some cerulean on my palette, add a little medium into that. And it might not be pure cerulean, it might have some cobalt, oh I like the pure cerulean. Okay, so I have some medium mixed in there and I just want a dry brush and this is a clean brush, I want to dry brush this in. That color again, these are just little layers, putting in layers of color one over top the other. Try to, try to set up this mood. I'm gonna add a little bit of cobalt with this cerulean. I'm already starting to need more medium in here because it's just still sucking up medium. Canvas is still hungry. Even though I got a block le level on it, it's still hungry for, for oil. <laughs> Give me more oil, feed me oil. <sighs> okay, so there we go. Okay, and so basically, I kind of made raw sky more blue there. Just a little bit more blue. And uh, I don't want it so shiny. That's not what I want it to be. And just for that reason, I'm going to go in with this big two inch brush here. I'm going to try to take some of the shine off. And I'm going to kind of do a little swirl pattern here. Because what I'm doing now is I'm removing some of the oil. leaving the pigment in place mostly.
because too much oil might make it too shiny too quick. I can always make it shiny. I can dull it up too, but I just don't want to, when I'm trying to see the color, I don't want to see a lot of lights reflecting off of my medium too soon, because then I can't see the color as easy. All right, so now I'm using this big brush, going in and dealing with some of the shine here. Also, by using a brick brush, you're not going to see brush marks so easily because I'm using a, like a circular pattern here and it's just the bigger the brush, the more you hide the brush marks because you just don't see that big old broad surface as easy as you see these little small individual one inch, three quarter inch brush surfaces. You see those a lot easier. Also, when you stumble like this, your blending is a lot more uniform. So you don't get so much, uh, you know, I don't really need a whole lot of, um, I really don't need a whole lot of brush strokes in that, in that, in that uh, atmospheric. Yeah, I just don't need it. What I need is blending though. I need soft fuzzy, nebula-like, you know, brush strokes. Just easy going brush strokes. So probably I'll be using this brush quite a bit as I get into the final steps of that. Now, what I'm gonna do behind Rob's head, I can already see right behind his head needs to be darker. So I'm gonna go back into this darker tone. I'm gonna actually go to my paint to my paint set, and I'm just gonna add a little bit of Mars Black to it, and just a little bit more ultramarine. And I'm not even gonna have to carry this because I got enough loaded into this brush right now to do this. But I need more tone here. I want this to be darker here because I need the uh, Nimi and the Sun to pop more away from the background. Again, this blue is too fat, too flat. It's not creating a volumetric. Also, it's too much similar to in tone to the color of what rise and the color of the sun. So it's very important for this to be darker. So I'm gonna take a layer and I'm gonna probably go to about right here on this Nimi with it. Then I'm gonna kind of go out a little bit into this nebula a little bit, or this little dust cloud around the, the falcon. Just try that out. Take this look at that tone and see how that works. See if that's helping. And again, I got a lot of juice in that. And that's one of the downsides about mixing it up in a cup like that. Sometimes, sometimes you'd want that juice all over the painting, and sometimes on the sides, but this part of the painting, we don't really need all that juice. So, but I have to either let it dry or let it get tacky, then come in with another brush and kind of tamp it down, just like you see me, saw me do. Probably come in with a mop brush and tamp that down some. But while I still have some tone here, I'm gonna just take that tone on this side to pop this head away from here some too. Because that tone is still I need to really get Ra's head popping. I still like this lighter color, so I'm gonna to tone it in. But right next to the head, I need to get some separation right there. And the way I'm gonna do it is just paint in just a little bit more dark value with that tone. Okay, so that's, that's very helpful. So that's helping. I need to blend this more. I don't need it to be so uh, a certain way. So I'm going to use the palette now. And what I'm going to have to do is I don't need all that medium in it. So I'm going to put some more ultramarine blue down and some more, I think I, no, no, no more doxazine purple. Just straight. And I think I'm going to just use a smaller brush. 
I'm gonna get yet another brush. And I'm just gonna pick up a little bit of that medium from that already, but not much. And I'm gonna go right in there again, because I really do need that to be nice and heavy. I want this little section right here. But I don't want it to be so just a line right next to his head. I want it to go out about an inch or so into this tone, into this uh, outer space tone. Evidently this brush had some tone in it, so let me clean it out. Didn't really hurt it because my color is so dark. Again, go back into Ultramarine and Doxazine Purple again, because I'm liking that. And then I'm gonna paint out from Ra's head. I'm gonna try to get as close as I can with this smaller brush without getting into that white and getting that into anything. And then just paint away a little bit. So it don't look like a line, but it looks like a shape. And then I'm gonna scumble it in. Okay. And what that's gonna do is cause his, cause his, uh, his head to pop out more from the background. I just need his head to pop out more. Then I'm gonna do something going this way, you know, like something in outer space is swinging this way with this darker color. Just these little subtle tones is what does it. And I can even use my finger to blend that. Don't have to get so special about that either. Okay, I see that. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, so now that I have that, what I want to do is just kind of fuzz out, just do some scumbling, fuzz out, because I don't want sharp shapes, or any particular sharp shapes. Scumble that into the other paint below. So it's in there and it starts to become one. The other tones, and then I'm gonna go in with my other big brush. So those tones are not seen so much. There we go, smooth it on out. Take away a little bit of that oil out of it. Because the, the dryness, the brush has a lot of, of space, a lot of fiber, so that means it sucks the oil away, it's dried in the paint, dried in the painting. So it sucks the oil away from the painting. So that's one way to take oil off of your painting. Use a large dry brush. Also, these brushes, these big brushes like this, are great for blending big areas like this. Even though they're really tiny, you could just use the corner of it, get into some light, nice little tight areas, and blend, blend, blend. Get some nice big blends, as opposed to little blends. Okay. All right, so now that we have that kind of going, it's starting to take on some, some the, the raw face is really starting to pop out a little bit and I'm liking that from that. And uh, like I say, this is still the underpaint. There's still a lot to do with it. And um, so, you know, we just have to carry on and keep doing what we're doing. Have to carry on and keep going because uh, you know, a little bit at a time, you know. Rome wasn't built in a day. What I'm gonna do is take this fan brush here and just have white with a little bit of medium in it. I'm just gonna go in here and do that. Just to give it a little burst of light right there. Just clean that up some, because I want that clean. Okay, so now that I have that clean, I can Okay, so I've got that kind of tone differently than it was when I first started. Now, whether I like it or not, I don't know. What I'm going to have to do is um, let that sit. Or I might even not even let it sit a day. I might just go in and just start right away introducing some black. Just a little smidge of it into this, 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 this tone up here, into this space scene. 
I do like the, the depthness of the deepness of the tone. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go just get this off the palette that's a little thicker. I'm gonna try it right here. There's a little bit of a wispy space. I'm gonna try a nice thick with not as much medium in it. Right here. It's just gonna, it just that needs to be more solid. And I just want to see, I want to see that tone more solid. I like the blueness of it, but some tells me that this thing is screaming for black, but I'm going to still try with this corner over here to get this richer and darker but without having to use black. I'm going to try. And I'm going to do so by simply not using any medium at all other than what's already on my palette. Let's see, the accent on purple with ultramarine blue. And I'm just gonna really just lay this stuff right in this corner. I mean, I'm putting it in about as, you know, it's not gonna be opaque because it does have some medium in it. But I want it pretty much opaque. You can see I'm kind of going, I'm kind of rounding a vignette in that corner a little bit because that's what I want to happen. Okay, so now, What's happening with that? Is that starting to create something special there as opposed to just black? Yeah, I think so. I'm gonna introduce some of that down here as well. And it doesn't have to be on the side yet because I need to get the business section of this right. Then I just make the side whatever that is. I just like the richness of that purple blue there. I just like it. And uh, I think I'm gonna live with it, but uh, I'm gonna have to build up quite a few layers. I already know that now. I'm gonna have to build up quite a few layers to get it the way I want it. I'm gonna have to put quite a few layers up in there. I don't want no wispy color. I want some interesting, thick, rich color there. Oh yeah, that's nice. I want interesting, rich color. And like I say, the color, when you're working with layers, you're not gonna get the perfect tone with just two layers. You're just not. You know, this may need three, four, five layers before it's all over and done with. And like I say, some of these layers, it's oil, so it might be still tacky. You might be still even, though you're doing something else, you still may be painting into, and you may think it's fully dry, you still may be scumbling into a slightly tacky dry layer of oil and it. Who knows? But the main thing is, is it toning? Is, are you getting the tones that you want, you know? Before I start painting my nebula, do I have a background tone that I want? Yes or no, you know? That's, that's usually gonna be uh, the $300,000 question there. Is that a yes or is that a no, you know? Okay, so now, that's better than it was. Not as good as it could be but good enough. Now what I'm gonna do is, now that I got that tone darker, I can see those spots that could be improved. Okay, what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm kinda at a certain point where my, my main well is run out of um, color. I haven't really lost control of my palette yet. Hands are quite dirty though. However, my, my um, I really like to clean my um, medium well so I can still work with nice clean color because I want to do that before I start going on Ra's face, working on some more of the forearm and the torso and the hands and so forth and perhaps working on the wings and the pedestal as well as well as his nimi. So I'm basically going to be, at this point I'm going to be moving all over the place with this. <clears throat> I mean, I just randomly because it's just Different areas is drying at different times. Uh, different colors I have mixed at different opportunities. Taking advantage of different opportunities of color. So, um, 
Likewise, what I need to do is, um, so first I'm gonna try a little bit of brush management. Let's get these brushes organized a little bit. Get a little brush management happening here. That never hurts anything. Put all the wet brushes in a wet brush bin. And put all the clean brushes in a clean brush bin. Clean up the old pallet blade. And just do a little bit of a reset, you know. Just do a little bit of a reset. And again, every day you just make a little bit more progress until the painting is exactly the way you want it to be. Okay, so I still have a lot of that, this color here. And like I say, uh, I like that color. And there's still plenty of places I can apply that color to. Um, some of this it seems like it's setting up. You know, when you put it on real thin like this, and especially if you brush it back and forth, back and forth, it's not going to be dry, but it's going to start getting tacky. It's going to get not really, really tacky, but tacky enough that you can begin to add another layer to it within hours of that layer. So I'm thinking in another hour or two, I might be ready to add some more purple to enrich in that background just even a little bit more. Don't know, I'll have to get there and see. If not, I'm gonna let this sit tomorrow. I'm gonna wrap it up so it doesn't dry out. And it might be like K-Roll syrup, you know? It might be like really thick syrup. But I'll be able to lay that in. I don't know if I wanna mix thick syrup. I might have to just throw it out. But you know, you'll see. Sometimes you have to just get up like at two in the morning <laughs> or you know, something like that. You got to put that layer on because that's when it's ready, you know. If you're going to conserve your mediums and your paints, some people just go ahead, throw it away, remix the next day. Um, it really depends on who you are. If you like to be efficient and uh, not waste. Well, if you don't mind just being convenient for you, I mean, it's all about your comfort in painting. It's not about a little bit of wasted material. It's really up to you. But at the bottom, at the, at the end of the day, it's how good is the paint is going to be. And the paint is coming along. I'm liking it. The blue field does not look as wispy and wimpy as it did before I first started. There's some more things I need to do to it. But it does not look as wispy and wimpy as it did before. And I'm still going to be, like I said, going in here and doing stuff like this. Trying not to pull any colors out of the still wet uh, undercoat that I have on my um, wings there. I just want this feel of, of, of uh, outer space to be a nice tone. I really do. And it's not just one tone. I want the whole overall tone tonality to be nice. You know? And there I got some white in there. God, dog. Oh, don't want that. So what I have to do when I mess up like that is one little callous stroke of the brush. And I had some really thick white from the other day. What I need to do is go in with a little tissue. Rub, rub, rub. Then I have to go back, making sure I got a brush with no white in it. And then hit that with some tone again and see if I can paint over that without to be real careful. Like I said, you rush these paints, you you know, you don't want to rush them. <laughs>